This is going to take some turns. The Manhattan Project is an unimaginatively titled film about a high school kid that builds a nuclear bomb for a science fair. I liked this movie when it was initially out in 1986, but after watching it again recently, I'm struck by how much it plays like an exaggerated version of my own high school experience. I'll come back to that. The film is the story of Paul Stevens. He's a brilliant kid, nerdy without the social stigma. He sneaks into a secret government lab like a boss. He stands up to the feds. He not only gets the girl, but she hits on him. Listen, what are you doing Sunday night? I can't help thinking that this is the writers putting their own high school fantasy into the script. I remember it differently. Overall, it's a kind of coming-of-age story wrapped around commentary on nuclear deterrence. It's not a great film. We're not going to be getting the Criterion Collection remaster, but it's a decent story and it makes me think about a few things. So the setup. A secret government weapons facility has set up shop outside Paul's hometown of Ithaca, New York. They're making plutonium. They store it in plastic jars full of goo, which, yeah, plutonium is really nasty stuff and you can't just store big lumps of it in a bucket. Your Geiger counter will start screaming at you. The lab is run by Dr. Lizardo, because John Lithgow is always Dr. Lizardo, and he has a thing for Paul's mom, prompting him to try and win favor by taking Paul on a tour and showing off his laser and robot arm, inadvertently giving Paul the intel he needs to break in and steal some of that sweet fizzol material for the science fair. Of course, you can't just swap a jug of plutonium with foil and shampoo and expect no one to notice. Shampoo? Yeah, we think either one of the generic local brands or Maybe something called Alberto's VO5, plus glitter. The military gets involved, some light bird claiming to be with Delta Force. Lieutenant Colonel Conroy, U.S. Army Delta Force. These men are with the Nuclear Emergency Search Team, a duly authorized government agency. I'm empowered to take over these premises as a temporary crisis center. And they assume that terrorism is the motive. Paul? Oh, take it easy, you're fine. No, I'm a terrorist. Haven't you been watching television? That's right, he used the phrase, I'm a terrorist. Here. No, I'm a terrorist. Haven't you been watching television? You people really live in your own world, don't you? I've thought of this many times over the years, whether as a teenager being asked leading questions by cops of dubious integrity, a cynical young man navigating the post-9-11 hysteria, and today. Both in terms of how the security state needs to create terrorists where there are none to meet their own demand for them, but also how social media has skewed how we weigh offhand comments which I know needs some clarification. What I mean is that in earlier times, things people said off the cuff were generally weighted less than written statements, partly because spoken words were only heard by those present and could be quickly forgotten while something put in writing not only endured but implied forethought and intent. But now we can post our angry first reactions or drunken screeds on the fly. Our petty arguments about bullshit are written up in clearly legible fonts for an audience to share. And everyone has a recording device to capture and disseminate any potentially offensive remark we might make. I mean, when I think back to some of the obnoxious shit we said in high school, at least two-thirds of my graduating class would be canceled as racist, misogynist monsters if there was a digital record of it. And not just the men but the women. I mean, today we hear stories of people losing jobs or being denied admission to universities over something they posted on Facebook their junior year. Spontaneous off-color jokes and verbal slips are weighted as if they had the same forethought and level of intent as the Gettysburg Address. But those adolescent years are largely about figuring out who we are, and part of that is seeing how people react when we say obnoxious, dumbass things. Most people that flash Nazi salutes or wear Che Guevara t-shirts and call themselves communists are just young, impulsive, and trying to be edgy. The vast majority of them grow out of it without harming anyone. It's part of the calibration process. Between the social crusaders and the security state, we've lost that. Just as with Paul's sarcasm that is obvious to anyone but a government intelligence analyst determined to find terrorists behind every blade of grass and Twitter post. In the film, this insistence on treating Paul as a terrorist inevitably leads them to cornering him and forcing him to rely on the only bargaining power he has, the bomb, which he assembles while crouched behind cover surrounded by federal agents trying to get a shot at him. And here we have the magic of mutually assured destruction. If he tries to leave, they can kill him. 
but if they try to move in closer, he can kill them all. The catch is that each side has to believe that the other will do it. Now, we all know that federal agents will shoot a kid, a dog, a woman holding a baby, a building full of kids. Give me a clear shot behind the ear and I'll turn them off like a switch. There's no ambiguity about the resolve, but will Paul set off the nuke? I doubt it. I mean, his girlfriend and his mom are right there in town. It doesn't matter how big the bomb is. Paul's resolve appears weak, and consequently, he's a low deterrence adversary, which the writers are clearly aware of. You turned it? No, no, it happened by itself spontaneously. So the bomb self-activates because of radiation mucking up the unshielded Radio Shack electronics he used, giving us a ticking clock tension builder to end the story on. The feds stand down now that they need Paul to save them. We get a Dr. Lazardo moment. And blow us all to hell! And the obligatory wire cutting scene. Three, two, one. The bomb is defused, everyone is happy to be alive, and now that the whole operation is exposed, the security state cuts their losses and absolutely has nothing to do with the totally coincidental heart attacks and fatal car crashes that befall people involved over the course of the next year. That part's not actually in the movie, but you know it, I know it, and the American people know it. And in the end, we have a nice little boy builds bomb, boy gets girl story, and a lesson in deterrence. It's about perception, not raw destructive capability. Don't sit at the nuclear table if no one believes you'll push the nuclear button. Either you'll get walked over despite your nukes, or you'll surprise everyone and we'll all have to play Fallout for the rest of our substantially shortened lives. But this is also a goofy high school movie, which brings to mind something else I want to mention. This film often comes up in reference to the story of David Hahn, a high school student in Michigan who tried to build a breeder reactor in his mom's garden shed. The story is told in detail by Ken Silverstein in his book The Radioactive Boy Scout and the short documentary The Nuclear Boy Scout, which features David explaining some of his experiments. This is now a makeshift reactor. If the reactor is working, you can now make plutonium. I went to high school with that guy. Now, I didn't really know David. He was a year or two behind me, and it was a very big school. But our social circles overlapped. Silverstein writes in his book on the subject, David had a small group of friends at Chippewa Valley. Not surprisingly, they tended to be science fanatics and were frequently, though not always, loners and outcasts as well. There was Spencer Hawkyard, a technology geek and computer wizard, Jim Miller, a skinny, nervous kid who lived near David's house in Clinton Township and shared his passion for all things nuclear, Andy and Jeffrey Hungerford, brothers two years apart who were highly knowledgeable about chemistry, and a few kids from his local scout troop. I was friends with Jim and Jeff, though I haven't talked to either of them in decades. There was a lot of overlap with these various subgroups of nerdy loners doing nerdy shit. I was more electronics and chemistry. Not the breaking bad kind, more breaking things. So when one morning Jim told me about his friend David doing nuclear experiments and trying to get some fissile material out of it, we had a detailed but purely theoretical discussion about the possibilities. I assumed it was all rather fanciful. I mean, sure, he might be taking apart a bunch of smoke detectors to get a lump of radioactive material, but I didn't take seriously the suggestion that he was actually building a neutron gun to make plutonium next to the garden trawls. He actually had been doing what he had been talking about. It wasn't a big news story at the time. EPA kept the whole thing kind of hushed while they cleaned up the site, and I was well done with everything high school by then. But when word got out that there was a big cleanup in that neighborhood, it wasn't hard to piece it together. Though I didn't know the full story until Silverstein's book was published. That's when I learned that David's undertaking was discovered after he was pulled over for some traffic infraction with some of his equipment in the trunk, which he then proceeded to inform the cops was radioactive. What we would now call a dirty bomb was certainly a possibility. That was one of our initial thoughts. Uh, again, we had thoughts too of a, of a nuclear weapon. It was uh, thorium-232, but this particular form of it was not only much higher than you'd find in nature, but it was uh, about 100 times the quantity that would be considered licensable. David was about to get a visit from the Environmental Protection Agency. The reason I bring this up, imagine what the response would be if this happened today. 
FBI would be all over him, his associates, and probably their associates. And more likely than not, they'd cook up some ridiculous conspiracy involving white supremacists and a dirty bomb or some such horseshit. Like in the film, today's security state is so fixated on their paranoid threat model that other explanations are practically inconceivable to them, and if they don't find the terrorists they're looking for, they'll create them. The reality of an awkward kid conducting experiments alone, purely out of his own curiosity, would almost certainly not be taken seriously today. Not when law enforcement foils terrorist plot is so useful. As far as any kind of malicious intent is concerned, the reality of this incident, like a misspelled drunken tweet, is probably better treated as the misguided mess it is rather than piling on layers of baseless assumption of hostile intent as would almost certainly happen today. In light of that, I think the more subtle lesson we can take from the film is that if you consistently treat peaceful people as a threat, they can be backed so far into a corner that they become threatening. Remember that Paul didn't even insert the plutonium core into his bomb until he was surrounded by snipers. I sit here at the close of the annual mass biker migration, and the road sounds kind of like a Mad Max movie down there right now.